And I'm George Whittem in the West. And together we are East West Audio Body Shop. Whoa, is it cold here back in the East. But on eWebs this Sunday, we'll be sizzling with the most respected voiceover coach in Hollywood, Maurice Tobias. She's graciously agreed to join the zaniness here, answer our questions, and give us her philosophy on the voiceover business. Boy, does her reputation precede her. I can't wait to have her on. I'll share my thoughts on large versus small recording spaces. Which way should you go in your home studio? And explain the differences about dealing with those different spaces, how acoustics have to be handled in those varying setups. All right. And in my tip of the week, well, we're not going to have a tip of the week this week. It's sort of talking about what George was just talking about. I have a video of the first installation of my new sound dampening solution, Studio Suit. I went all the way to Chicago to personally oversee this install, and we were all impressed with the results. I can't wait for you to share it. Uh, NAM show was a blast. Well, it will be a blast. Well, it depends when you see this video, but I'm going on Friday and Saturday, and I'll have a lot of video to share, but I'll have at least one of the best clips from the show to share with you on Sunday night. All right. That's East West Audio Body Shop. Live this Sunday night, 9 in the East and 6 in the West. Watch us and join the fun in the chat room at ewabs.com, and we'll see you then. He's the home voiceover studio engineer to the stars in Los Angeles, California. A Virginia tech grad whose knowledge of the latest recording gear is second to none. He's a voice actor and the home studio master, hailing from Buffalo, New York. His home studio skills and knowledge of voiceover recording is unmatched. When Dan and George talk shop, people listen, and the talk continues tonight. Welcome to East West Audio Body Shop. And now, live from his high-tech facility in Santa Monica and his penthouse studio in Buffalo, here are George Whittem and Dan Leonard. Thank you, Dave Quavassier. I'm Dan Leonard in the East. And I'm George Whittem in the West. And together, we are East, East West, West Audio, Audio Body, Body Shop. Shop. All righty. Well, it's almost the end of January already. What? What? 2013? almost gone <laughs> you must be happy about january passing though i hear it's chilly up there it has it has been very very cold here in the northeast and uh but it's gonna warm up for a couple of days and then it's gonna get really cold again it's yeah it's it's supposed to happen that way it's seasons i know but i mean we're talking over a couple of days i mean it's gonna go up to 50 and then it's gonna go back down into the teens and you know that's, yeah those swings are brutal those they can be. Are brutal, yeah. Yeah. And flu season's been really bad, except for me because I got my flu shot in November. Did you get your flu you're, shot? You're good for this year. I'm good for and this next year. Next year, there'll be a whole new strain of flus. And I'll get another flu <laughs> shot. <laughs> I don't get, I haven't had a flu shot in my entire life. Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to, I'm going to have tracks from flu shots. <laughs> you know, I'm never had one. Oh, well, you should. Anyway, I know California, it's going to cause problems. <sighs> yes, it's going to cause you not having the flu. So far, so healthy. What Outstanding. <laughs> well, gl glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Well, good evening and welcome to East West Audio Body Shop. Uh, we've got, geez, like we don't always have a great show for you tonight. Fabulous. We've got information. We've got stuff. And we have Maurice Tobias. She is joining us tonight. She is a legendary Hollywood voiceover coach. She works with the big boys and oh, yeah. girls. And uh, she's going to tell us a little bit about that, and she'll answer your questions and the voluminous amount of questions that I have, uh, being the voice talent that I am. And, you know, and I, of course, I just want to impress the heck out of her. <laughs> right, of course. This is your chance, man. Here's, here's, my, here's my big chance. <laughs> anyway, and we've got, we've got lots of uh, interesting information. Uh, you know, you were at NAM this week. We've mm -hmm. got a great discussion about uh, the size of your recording space, which will lead into uh, a video I did this week on the first install of Studio Suit, which will be very interesting. And, of course, announcements and anything else you guys try to throw at us. I'm throwing things at you now. <laughs> is it my you turn? Know. Do I get it to talk now? now? Okay. I was I was about to say you wanted to talk about large recording uh, facilities versus small ones. Yes. Well, uh, yeah. I figured. You know, um, we've talked a lot about ways of dealing with home studios, treating them, soundproofing, and all that stuff. 
But, you know, one thing that comes up a lot that I'm noticing, especially now with the popularity of the new Studio Bricks booth coming out, is that uh, everybody, there's this conception that a small, you know, voiceover booth will sound better or it will be easier to deal with acoustically. And um, while small spaces can be a lot easier to, yeah, my mic does sound off, doesn't it? Sound, does just, little, just, just a little bit. It sounds a little thin, doesn't it? It does. I'll just turn up the EQ a little bit, like the bass EQ, I guess. One, two, three, four. How's that? Is that better? I don't it know. Something's okay funny. Here. Something's funny. Whatever. All right. Well, thanks for noticing, you guys. See, you guys listen so closely. I love that. Uh, <laughs> anywho, um, where was I? So, yeah. So, small booths can be a lot more challenging to deal with acoustically, but they're easier to soundproof because it's a smaller space, so you have a lot less work to do to make it sound good. Uh, or I'm sorry, to keep the noise out. When you have a small space, there's less to seal, there's less materials, there's less cost. So, you know, it's sort of a trade-off. And um, so so what's the what's the way to go in your situation? I always start with ask, especially when I'm dealing with people where I can't see the space myself with my own eyes and hear it with my own ears. Um, I always say, well, okay, so you've got a bedroom and you've got a closet. Which space do you want to record in? Just start by setting up your microphone in the in the room and just hit record. Um, now, I recommend recording a little copy and then after you finish recording, letting uh, yourself just record some room tone. Reason being is uh, if you just hit record, we don't really have a level, cal- we don't really have a reference point for how loud your recording level should be. So it makes it really difficult to figure out where your noise floor is. But if you start with a little copy and then record noise floor for maybe 30 seconds to a minute, um, then you can send that to uh, Dan or I, and we can listen to it, and we can kind of get an idea of what ambient noise problems you are dealing with. Um, if it turns out that you know it's just going to be too not cost-effective, too much work, or any combination of things to use that room, then maybe we'll talk about putting you in the closet. Um, but... It's much easier to take a large room and make it sound nice and neutral and natural um, than it is a small room. And the main reason for that really is low frequency problems. It's not the mid-range, high-range stuff, the treble and the mid-range. It's really more the mid-low stuff. That's the stuff that resonates and makes it sound like you're in a box, makes that boxy sound or that closet whisper room sound um, You know that we really want to avoid. And uh, so the reason why bigger rooms sound better is because they don't resonate at such a high frequency. The smaller the box that you're inside, the higher the frequency that the box tends to want to resonate or ring to. And um, in a small closet or anything smaller than, say, 6 by 8 or smaller, that resonant frequency is going to be pretty high up in the frequency range. And I'm talking about 160 maybe 200 hertz. And what is that? Well, that's right in the middle of your voice. And uh, so what happens is that where most of the energy is in your voice, the most intensity is frequency-wise, is going to land right in the middle of that resonant frequency of that room. It's going to make that thing ring like a bell. So it's it can be challenging to deal with that in a small space. In a much larger space, like a bedroom or an office, is there's a lot more, usually there's a lot more stuff in there to begin with. So there's desks and furniture and blankets and pillows and who knows what. Maybe there's a, a sofa or there's drapery, something. There's all these different things in there breaking up the sound for you, doing part of the job for you right away. There's usually a closet or something with a bunch of clothes in it. So that's usually soaking up the bottom end and acting like a big bass trap. So in a big room, what you end up usually only have to do is just sort of absorb the mid range, the mid and the high end couple, you know, some acoustic foams, moving blankets. You don't need a lot of expensive materials. They don't need to be thick and heavy, and they don't have to deal with a lot of low frequency. Um, But in a small closet now, again, that's going to resonate a lot more. So we need to use the right treatment. And uh, most of the time, in almost any case, just treating it with two-inch foam or one or two layers of uh, moving blankets is not going to do the trick. Um, What it's going to do is it's going to absorb a lot of high and mid-range stuff, but that low-end stuff's going to keep bouncing around. So it's going to make it sound kind of dry and not so much dry and dead, but sort of muffled and uh, boxy. It's hard to describe it in any other way, but it definitely is a boxy sound. 
Sort of like what you sound like now. Yeah, do I sound boxy right now? <laughs> well, you got a little bit of low end on there, but they needed it. <laughs> you know what? You know what? I'm, I'm obviously long overdue of doing an overhaul on my studio. Maybe I should document the whole process. What do there you guys you say? <laughs> it's time to clean out the old Mackie board. Yep. Um, so, anywho, so I'm thinking, you know, small spaces, how do you treat them? Well, you need thicker materials, it needs to be denser, and it needs to cover much more of the overall square, uh, the overall surface area. You know, a small closet, you may have to cover 80 to 90% of the walls in there to get rid of all the reflections and all the issues that are going to cloud up the sound for you. So, there's lots of ways to do it. Dan's going to, we're going to have a video later showing Dan's new. Uh, technique with studio suit which is a, probably the easiest way to convert a closet or any small booth into a great sounding space really quickly and dan will show you guys later and explain why it works so well but it's not just a, about absorbing the mid to high frequencies you have to absorb everything down to 100 hertz or so in order for it to sound really nice now the lowest of the low end below say 100 hertz or so the base the real base frequency range we don't have to worry about that as quite as much because then we can use a high pass filter so we can use some filtering we can use a, a preset in your software or if your mic preamp or microphone has a knob or switch for high pass that can often clear up the resonance the low low resonance in a room and i almost always recommend using a high pass filter just universally across the board because it there's almost nothing most people need to keep below 100 or even 80 hertz, depending on your voice, uh, that you, that the voice that you've been gifted with. <laughs> so I have heard some that resonate down into the 60s, believe it or not. That's pretty rare. Most of the time, it's 80 to 90. So don't worry so much if, you're, if your room has a little bit of rumble or a little bit of that low, low end resonation. High pass filter that out, you'll be fine. It's not worth the expense to try to treat out all of the low frequency junk especially the rumble that's the most expensive stuff to get rid of and the least important to worry about in a voiceover booth because it's way out of the range of your voice at least it was <laughs> <laughs> most of the time yeah. yes well interesting yeah i mean i i have i have two facilities here i mean i have my room and we can hear what my acoustics sound like in my control room mm -hmm. and i do occasionally record stuff in here like if i'm like too lazy to go back to the booth and um you know and 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 clearly i sound like i'm in a bigger room in here but i there is some there's some orlex on the walls in here because it really sounded big before yeah so, so you can treat a room like this uh but then somebody mentioned something very good about if you're in your office if you if you have an office studio um you of course are closer to your computer Right. Which can cause some noises, which is one of the reasons for an isolation booth. Right. And uh, and that's why I have that. Now, as I, everybody knows, I've coveted this closet for years. <laughs> and because it was four and a half by three and a half, it's, it's the perfect size booth. Yeah. And so it turned out to be. And uh, But, you know, that's why some people would have, you know, if you don't have a closet that big, well, you do what you can. Yeah. If you have a closet like that. We can show you a way to treat it and and deal with the 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 uh, the low resonance uh, uh, that you get out of that, mm -hmm. which is one of the things we'll talk about with studio uh, suit in just a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. But that that's it's it's an interesting discussion because everybody's house is different. Yeah, and everybody has got different problems. Sometimes, especially in a rental situation or being in a city like we are here in L.A., you know that we just can't find a closet big enough. One or two, we just can't spare a closet. We just don't have the storage. No basements here, right. and and not much attics here to either. And so you know you have to do what you can. And that's sometimes you have to get a booth. Sometimes a whisper room or studio bricks or vocal booth or something is going to be the necessary tool for you to be able to get the, enough quiet for enough hours of the day for you to get your job done. You know, right. or live out in the country, or you got to move. Yeah, uh, yeah. Where, I actually had here? I had a weird one. I had a client. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a referral from Whisper Room. This guy came to me and he said, I bought a Whisper Room, but not for what you might think I bought it for. I bought it for sleeping. He got a huge Whisper Room. It was like 12 by 14 feet, something crazy big. Yeah. Just big enough that it would fit in a, in a bedroom. 
that he could still put his bed in and everything. <laughs> and so he would go into there, then go into the whisper room, shut the door and try to go to sleep. But, you know, the problem is, is it doesn't filter out the low frequency stuff, the, the rumble. And that was the stuff that was keeping him awake. Right. So, you know, and he was like, what can I do about this? And I'm thinking, okay, well, let's see. He already spent about $15,000. <laughs> um, he's renting. Um, okay. Can you move? <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> seriously, man? <laughs> <laughs> oh man i felt so bad for him i even felt worse for whisper room who called me to help yeah. this guy fix the problem and i think he ended up returning this monstrosity to whisper room Good. right and because the solution was <laughs> ambient yeah right <laughs> think about that for a second. <laughs> oh boy anyway all right it takes all well, kinds it, it does well i'm sleeping in a whisper room i you know i it, just go into a you know a, a, a sensory deprivation chamber yeah, you know, what do they they call those things? Yeah. Anyway, we've got a lot more coming up here, and that's but that's uh, an interesting uh, discussion, which we could probably continue, which we will continue in our next segment. Here, uh, we get into uh, talking about Studio Suit, and we have Maurice Tobias, which I know you're all waiting excitedly for. She'll be joining us in just a little bit, and uh, we have uh, announcements coming up and more. So stay right where you are here in East West Audio Body Shop because we'll be right back. Now back to the only webcast done with two cans, two geeks, and a string. East-West Audio Body Shop with George Winham on his end in the West and Dan Leonard in the East. All right. And we are back here on East-West Audio Body Shop. You're probably all wondering what this thing is. Yes, I was going to ask you, what the heck is that thing, Dan? This thing is, thank you very much. This is an RCA Veracoustic uh, ribbon microphone. Uh, from about 1943, I think is the, uh, the time that it came about and, uh, I own one. And as you can hear, I am talking on it and it works and, and it works just dandy. And you have yeah. that plugged into what? I have this plugged into a cloud lifter that goes into my, into my channel strip. And then it goes through, you know, uh, there's a rubber band connected to my Mac and it just, it's amazing how it works. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, how does that sound to you? Now, this is the kind of microphone. This was the, actually the forerunner of the legendary RCA 77 DX, which some of you may be familiar with, yeah. uh, a capsule looking type of microphone, which was probably the best ribbon microphone made yeah. uh, by RCA. Uh, and, um, what this thing is, it's the same exact same motor. It's the exact same design. Uh -huh. So let me see if I can recreate. 1980 for you here when I was on WJYE and, be, and I would just get on there and go Joy FM 96 all music all the time yeah that pretty much does it okay good <laughs> yeah, the thing is, is you're not supposed to use a ribbon mic in proximity you're actually supposed to be back here like that right but of course then back in those days when they would use ribbon mics they were in these big studios that we were just talking Huge about rooms, yeah and you had an ambiance of a big room right you know, you very know, different I, Right. And so I think some microphones actually said stand at least six feet away, which is like, we don't want, we don't want to hear you <laughs> anyway. So anyway, just sit back and relax. It's time for some announcements. All righty. We have our announcements. What happened to my announcements here? 
Well, Why I don't can you say start? I'll kick off the top and say welcome to our new members. Thank yes. you, uh, Lee Penny and Paula Bushnell. They both signed up in the past week since the last show, and uh, thank you so much for signing on. And we hope to give you lots of value and uh, bring some interesting bonus content as we come up with it. Give us some time. <laughs> We're going to have some good stuff for you. But yeah. thanks for coming on and supporting us. And uh, what, if you want to know what this membership thing is all about, go to ewabs.com. And there's a memberships uh, tab that you can read about. But what it basically is, it's thirty nine ninety five a month. And it gives you unlimited email access to Dan and I privately. So if you want support as, uh, as you need it, um, you'll have Dan and or I responding or to you. Or both. And, uh, you know, getting back to you with, um, with answers about whatever, you know, and we can, we can do a lot of stuff by email. We can send you, we can send us sound samples. We can give you notes. We can send you diagrams, all sorts of stuff. Right. Just don't challenge us. <laughs> what don't does that tell mean? Us we're, don't tell us we're wrong. Oh, okay. Hey, Is I that, got no problem being told wrong as long as I, don't like I am wrong. To- I, if people are paying for our opinion, uh, I don't like being told we're wrong. Hey, you can know pay what? If more somebody's to hear paying wrong. from paying me, you can tell me I'm wrong all day long, as long as you're paying me. That's <laughs> okay. how I look at it. <laughs> all right. That's an East Coast, West Coast thing, obviously. <laughs> right. <laughs> all righty. What else we got? Oh, we have to thank our sponsors, of course. But we'll mm-hmm. do that anyway. Harlan Hogan, who I met this week. I, act, I mean, we've met Harlan a million times, yeah. but I actually got to physically meet him and hug him. Oh, and that's he's nice. like, yes, it was, it was kind of pleasant. He's a good he, hugger, isn't he? He, I think so. <laughs> It was, it was good for me. I don't know. It was, I was amazed that he actually showed up. So just happened to be in Chicago. And of course, uh, some of our donors, Eric Aragoni and, uh, yeah, the trumpet guy, George Whitham senior. Yes. Thanks dad. Absolutely. I thought it was you for a second. I'm like, you're donating to our own show. Well, boy, that's really good. Uh, let's see. Worldvoices.org, uh, worldvo.com. Go to the website, check it out. We have a new website there. Uh, it's there's you know there are special members only areas to it, but we want to show you what we're all about at at, uh, at Wovo, and so go over to uh, over to worldvo.com and check it out. And uh, it's a great site. Now, thanks to Andy Curtis for putting that together. He can't hear us; he's in Australia, right, unless right. unless he's hiding in there. Somewhere. Our can with strings don't go that far. That's true. Well, it could actually. It's not true. I just could really pull it tight. It can be heard all over the world. Right. And Mark Schwartz, your graphics. Now, what are we going to do with those? Well, Mark sent us some new updated graphics to uh, start integrating into different parts of the site so that we can get a little bit fancier production value. You know, he's fixed some of the backgrounds on the graphics and stuff. So uh, thanks for sending those in, Mark. We really appreciate it. We'll, we'll make good use of those. And uh, we jump out. Yeah, we're trying to make things, you know, he's trying to help us spruce things up a little bit, you know, right. which we really appreciate. It's really kind of, of our viewers to, if you can't make financial donations, to make donations in other ways, like uh, providing us some, you know, unique content or video clips, uh, questions for us to answer, content, anything that will help, you know, uh, keep the show moving forward and keeping it interesting to watch. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Now you're doing another webinar uh, with Voiceover Extra uh, on uh, audiobook mastering. Are you not on February twentieth? Yeah, I think that is February twentieth. I hope I got the date right. Um, well, but, you'll show up then, and you know, hopefully yeah. other people. Know. <laughs> it's, well, I think you'd have to be uh, not in Voiceover to not know about it because uh, John Florian's been sending out the email blasts. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I figured, you know, I did the one on editing, and I thought maybe it was time to do one on mastering. I'm getting a lot of questions about that lately, and uh, I'm just going to kind of blow the roof off of the dis- – I'm just going to demystify the heck out of it and just wait till you see how easy and quickly you can do this with the right tools, the right settings, and the right workflow. So Are that's you- uh, that's what I'm going to do. You're going to have like a magic wand and a wizard's hat? And- <laughs> I probably that's that- should. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> that's what I want to make it I- – I really want to make it easy. I'm not – you know uh, – um, it can be very uh, mystifying as to how you actually, how, how do you master audio for an audio book? And uh, well, you know, cause the instructions that are provided by ACX um, and audible can be really, uh, really strange. You know, they have yep. a lot of steps and they're, they're trying to achieve a goal that uh, you, we can do these days with a f- far fewer steps. So that's right. what I'm going to show you. All right. And uh, if you want to be one of our sponsors, 
Just write to us at uh, ewabshop at gmail.com. A couple of people are stepping forward saying, I might be interested in that. Maybe you have a business you'd like to advertise to other voiceover artists. That's all we talk about. Business to business, baby. Business to business. Look us up. Talk about a niche market. Mm -hmm. And also the Facebook thing, which we have to, we have to sort out. We have two Facebook pages. The right. majority, we have like 860 people on the original East West Audio Body Shop yeah, Facebook count. page, which yeah. was East West Audio Body Shop. Two it words. was East West Audio, Audio Body, Body Shop. Shop. Now it's <laughs> four words. East West Audio Body Shop. Four words. Five, so, five words. East West Audio Body Shop. See, I counted Body Shop as one word. <laughs> it's, it's, is it, maybe it is one word. Have we been writing it wrong all this time? Uh, maybe not. I hope not. <laughs> uh, but anyway, go over there, like that, become a member over there. We want to transfer the 860 people that are on the one site over to the other page. Or we'll oh, yeah. keep both. Well, we're you know, eventually and, we, we, eventually we're going to retire the the, the personal eWebs account because it's right. just too much, and we have to resyndicate stuff everywhere. You guys right. don't want to know all this. Just believe me, it's going to be just easier. go over just, and like just, it. Just, just like it, will you? Yeah. Come on. All right, all right. Let's move on to the next item on our agenda tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I had to go to Chicago this week. And, you know, brief story, I, I wanted, it was the first commercial install of, of Studio Suit, which mm -hmm. I have in my own booth here. And uh, so I had a flight, it's not easy to get to Chicago if you, you know, from Buffalo, unless you fly southwest in the Midway. And flying in the Midway is like really cool because you actually see people in their backyards looking up as the plane is like landing in there. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's a little out of the way from where my client was. And uh, so I had to fly into O'Hare, which means I had to fly through your hometown of Philadelphia. Oh, baby. So and we got delayed on the runway. Best food and, in the uh, best food in an airport. They've won awards I, for that. Everything else that. blows, but the food I is great. I, I I ran by these places because I had to run through <laughs> there. But we get delayed on the runway, and I'm thinking, oh great, I might make the flight to Chicago, but the studio suit that I was bringing with me in a duffel bag and a suitcase is going to end up staying in Philadelphia, and then I'm on just on an expensive joyride. And uh, you know, and I'm on the phone calling you know U.S. Air going, I, I got to get the you know. They're like, we'll take care of it, hopefully. Well, this pilot put pedal to the metal, and we got into Philadelphia in a hurry. Uh, and I did show up in Chicago with my uh, with the entire studio suit, and I went over to Doug Schutz's house and roll it and show him what studio suit does. You got it. Okay, this is installation number one. We're at Doug Schutz's house in Lake Bluff, Illinois. And this is what it is. It's a five by four walk-in closet with some shelves on the side. He has his, as you can see, he's got his screen here. All the cords come through the wall right here. And you can hear the, the hollowness of the room. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some studio suit in here, which I think is probably the perfect thing for this particular room. And we'll document the uh, the construction of that and how we'll see how that improves it. Now you can get the Target Tornado, the Weather Channel's special tornado video for only $19.95. You'll see lots of terrifying tornadoes with rare, close-up footage of these unbelievably destructive twisters. You'll also learn about the history of nature's biggest killer tornadoes and experience the thrill of the chase as the target tornado rides along in cars with actual storm chasers searching for monster storms. Okay, good. I got six hooks there. Okay, we've done all the installation, and let's take a look around at how Studio Suit fits inside Doug's studio here. We have it in the corner. You can see how it billows and drapes, and how it fits on the door, and how the door, there's the door handle there.
but mostly you can hear how incredible it sounds in here. Now, there is noise coming from the outside from the furnace, which is a bit of a problem, but you turn the furnace off, except when it's, you know, 10 degrees or whatever. But once again, that's how his studio is set up. And I am very, very, I'm very pleased with the result here. Now you can get the Target Tornado, the Weather Channel's special tornado video for only $19.95. You'll see lots of terrifying tornadoes with rare close-up footage of these unbelievably destructive twisters. You'll also learn about the history of nature's biggest killer tornadoes and experience the thrill of the chase as the Target Tornado Riders rides along in the cars with the actual storm chasers searching for monster storms. Good, good, good. All right. All right. So anyway, so that's Studio Suit. Uh, what is it? Let me just say read Isaiah because it's military surplus. We've taken uh, instruments of war and we have turned it into plowshares and pruning hooks for voiceover <laughs> studios. How do you like that? That's great. That's, that's literally true. The proof is uh, in the playback, man. It, it is. It's I mean, good. it. That was a big hollow closet that, that Doug had, and it was a perfect place to test it. I mean, it, I have it in my booth, and nobody's complaining about mine. Mm -hmm. But you can hear how it, we were, everything that we were talking about in the last segment, when George was talking about uh, big rooms versus small rooms, what that low frequency was like in, a, in the hollowness. This stuff eliminates the need for bass traps. I'm, I'm not sure how it does it. It just, it's, it absorbs well, across the spectrum. It, it is a base. I mean, it's, it's what we call in the business a broad spectrum or a broadband absorber. Absorber, So right. it's, an, it's base trapping and mid and everything all in one piece, which right. can't, can't make it easier than that. That's right. So it will be available for uh, retail fairly shortly. I still have a couple of little things I have to do with it. Like I have to find a silk screen for a mustache <laughs> to put on there. And, uh, uh, right. and, you know, and it can be custom cut. I'm going to be probably cutting it into sheets that are uh, five by eight. So it'll be easy to hang in, in a situation like that, mm -hmm. but it can be hung on a shower curtain. It can be hung on those rails there. You can nail it to the wall if you own your own house. Um, but it's, and also can be used with a, you know, with a, a PVC cube. If you're good with PVC pipe, make a three-sided cube, uh, four by four by seven or something like that and cover it with this stuff. It's amazing. I, you know, I, I couldn't believe it when I, when I tried it and it just worked out really well. And I was so pleased with how well it worked at, uh, at, at Doug's house. And Is it too early to say what the price point would be for like a it's, small setup? It's going to be about a hundred dollars a sheet. For that five and by eight sheet, right? For a five by eight sheet. And okay. it, co it covers five by eight, you know, mm -hmm. and do you need the entire room covered? It yeah. depend, depends on the room. If yeah. you're in a closet full of clothes. Now, the great thing is, is you can put it in a closet and put it on sliders or on a, on a, on a shower curtain thing or something like that. And you can still, still use the closet. Right. Spouses and, will love that. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, spousal approval is don't overlook that. Yeah. <laughs> and does it have so, the grommets already? And the grommets are already in it. See, and it that's also, huge right there. And it also has little ties in it. It's amazing stuff. Cool. So as soon as I learn how to package this, and I think I figured out a way it's going to take you know, vacuum sealing because I can make it much smaller yeah. and we'll be, we'll be able to ship it and all of you will have this in your studios and we'll all have nice, quiet studios. Mm -hmm. Very nice. All right. It's not soundproofing, but it is sound dampening, yeah. but it does, it does certainly cut down a little bit of the exterior noise, which yeah. might get your noise floor under minus 50, which as we all know is the magic number. Yep. Anyway, we're taking up way too much time because we have a fabulous guest coming up. Somebody who will sh tell us the truth about our industry Maurice Tobias, she'll be with us in just a couple of minutes here on East West Audio Body Shop. So you stay right where you are, and we'll be right back. VO Studio Tech. Recording made simple. 
Hi, I'm Peter McHugh. This is Jim Tasker from Los Angeles, California. Hi, this is Bill Ratner in Los Angeles. Hi, this is Scott Rummel here in Yorba Linda, California. Hi, my name is Rick Wasserman. Hi, this is Tom Kane. Hi, my name is Vanessa Marshall. Hi, my name is Zurich. Hi, I'm Mary McKittrick. Randy Thomas chiming in. Hi, this is Joe Szymanski. Hey, this is Rick Robles. Hi, my name is John Patrick Armstrong. I was turned on to George by none other than Don LaFontaine, who always swore by his help. George is absolutely awesome. ISDN, Source Connect, Phone Patch, FTP, you name it, George has set it up. It's really the best thing I've ever done for myself. I feel free, safe, fearless, like anything is possible in here. Unless you like to look for opportunities to waste time, call George. And he did all of that, long distance over the phone and the internet. I'm very happy with George and uh, I cherish him. Thanks, George. You make it easy. This is East West Audio Body Shop, where Dan and George don't speak geek. And we're back. Oh, we're back. Right. Are, are we back? Hello? And we're back. Hello? We're back. <laughs> All right. Oh, what a wonderful guest we have with us tonight. Joining us, you're in Los Angeles, right? I am. Okay. From Los Angeles, California, <laughs> we have probably the premier voiceover coach of the stars in Hollywood. Maurice Tobias, welcome to East West Audio Body Shop. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure having you. And uh, God, there's so much stuff we could, we could, we could talk to you about. Uh, but first, we have our initial question, what we have to ask everybody. How did you get started as a voiceover coach? Well, let's see. I have a background in theater, um, studied directing. Uh, I was first woman directing commercials in New York. And um, uh, director associate of the actor's studio, so that's the the point of view that I, I come to the uh, the microphone with my clients. Um, Bob Lloyd, the original voice caster, when I was I came out here to direct a package of commercials, and uh, he called me, and he said you should have your own thing, and I said you know, but Bob, there are like ten workshops around town now which is, of course, ironic because there are so very many everywhere now. And he said, but nothing for the working pro. And he said, some people are still doing the same read they did when they got in the business. And I said, well, you know, I kind of noticed it feel, felt like voiceover was kind of frozen in time. But when I came out to California, that's when I joined an ad agency. And that's when I followed through on the commercials that I was directing all the way into post-production, which is when we used voiceover. I had never really encountered voiceover when I was directing in New York. And so I thought, well, I guess this is it, and uh, this is how it's done. And until Bob corroborated the observation I made, I thought, okay, well, this is just kind of the secret handshake. And then once he said, you know, you should have your own thing, um, and I said, well, you know, that I, I appreciate that. And he said, no, I'm, I'm serious. And a week later, I was in business with a group of people, and he had gathered together. And at the time, Kat Lehman, who became one of the top voice, female voices in the business, was his assistant. She was just working her way into the business, and he volunteered her to be my assistant as well. So that's the very, very beginning of my working with voice talent um, exclusively outside of the acting, uh, the acting arena. Wow. And so you came from it really from the production end of things and yes. uh, the production uh, so and the ad agency, you know, you know, sitting in those rooms and having those conversations that everyone thinks they understand. And then the specs get created. And right. um, and then, you know, there's that other aspect to it, which is after the auditions go in. And I'm always saying to uh, clients, the, that's the imponderable. You have no idea what that conversation is. You have no idea what the political battles are. You know, all you do is hear the result. And we try and ascertain what tr transpired from the audition to actually hearing what went on the air, whether it was them or someone else, so that you start learning a little bit about where the conversation is, the cultural conversation, and why certain voices are booking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and of course, sometimes you see the politics if you're actually in a session and you're hearing them arguing over an ISDN, like, well, it's got to be like this. Well, it's got to be like that. Right. So, and then you've got to be a professional and go, okay, whatever you want. <laughs> Just oh, yes. do it that way. Oh, yes. You live to serve. 
absolutely. I, and I serve with distinction. Uh, anyway, how have you? So, so you 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 come out to California and you're and you're doing all uh, doing the production work and, and and learning all this and and being part of it. In your view, how has all of this changed over the last 10, 15 years? Well, I think the best way to describe it, I was having dinner with Rita Venari a little while back, and she said to me, what happened to our lovely little business? <laughs> and I said, it's neither. And that's really, it's neither lovely and it's neither little. It has become, and I mean, we're talking 15 years now, discovered. It was this quiet little adjunct. I remember um, in that, that same time when I was at the uh, agency that was uh, Wells West, Wells Rich Green West, and uh, I was casting a multi-voice uh, radio spot, and Bob Lloyd was the uh, casting director. He was the only casting director in the business at the time. And I said to him, I was listening to the auditions, and I said, you know, I'm not really hearing what I, I'm looking for. He said, well, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for that second city thing. He said, oh, you want actors. <laughs> and I As said, opposed to? Yeah. And I said, who are these people? He said, voice talent. I had no idea there was a distinction. Oh, boy. And hmm. I said, okay, I want actors. So, you know, he called in a whole different group of people, and we got what we were looking for. So there was that distinction. There were a lot of distinctions that have fallen by the wayside, not only just in terms of where the work comes from and, uh, and who's seen a certain way. There are a lot of blurred boundaries that were very, very hard boundaries when I first came out here and started focusing on voiceover. And so, you know, as far as um, the celebrity conversation and, uh, you know, somebody did animation, that's what they did. I mean, it's still hard to do crossovers when you get known for something. And it's particularly, let's say you sign with an agency and they've signed you for imaging. And, you know, you're all excited because you're now with a major player and you think that's going to be an open door to promo and you come to find you got to start all over again winning the favor of those agents because they're only seeing you as radio talent yeah so yeah so you know so, well, so let's, let's, go ahead yeah yeah anyway yeah so uh, let's, okay. let's talk about representation for a little okay. bit uh, because I, everybody you know in our audience and those of us in the voice business we all wonder about agents and and it, the chances are the perception from the other side, from the agent's point of view, is probably a lot different from the talent's point of view. What's now, what's the representation business really like? Well, uh, first of all, you know, agents are people, they and are. they have feelings. <laughs> okay, and it, and I, and I think people, you know, talent, uh, forget that. And part of the reason that you'll you'll see maybe a wall with uh, certain agents over the years is because it's very hard. It's very hard to be in the position that they're in, liking people, caring about people, working with people year in, year out, and seeing the fluctuations in cre careers. And they, they do the very best they can to steel themselves against the emotional aspect of that and and really focus on the business aspect so from the agent's point of view what they are looking at is inventory so when material comes to them they're not having and this is really the same conversation with producers no one anymore any longer has a competency conversation they're not they're not listening to a demo and deciding whether or not you can actually do the work the producer is listening to how you do the work. So is the agent, but the agent's also listening for, is this, some, is this a, uh, something I don't have in my roster? Is that something I don't have in um, my inventory? And that's a very different conversation than whether or not uh, someone should be stepping up their career and, and getting this kind of representation or moving to another agency. It really has to do with I have so many I have so many spots on the bench and am I covered so when an agent says to someone you know we're really covered in your area get back to us in 6 months they mean it 
they're not blowing you off because it may well be that a contract expiring or some other change is being anticipated. And that's that's not a hard, hard no. That's stay in touch. Mm-hmm. But understand that the perspective from the agent is very different than the perspective from the talent. The talent wants to be given a chance, wants a fresh fresh start, wants to change things up. And the agent's always looking at, am I covered? Am I covered in the areas that are now coming in over the transom on a regular basis? Right. So what? If, so if someone wants to get an agent, and we all want to get an agent, some of us have more than one agent. Um, some of us have too many agents. But how do you go about getting an agent for someone who doesn't have represent, representation right now? I've always believed that it's always best to get referred into somebody because sending out piles and piles of demos is not necessarily the best way to, uh, to get yourself in somewhere. It isn't, but it is a way. And for every person who says that doesn't work, there are, you know, 10 people who say, but that's how I got my agent. Right. The main thing is, the major difference is that um, when you, when you, let's say 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you sent out material, an agent or somebody at the office listened and said, you know, we should, you should we should bring her in. She she sounds like some someone we could work with. You come in, you read, and then and there they would say, okay, let's let's work together. We'll drop the paperwork. That very rarely happens anymore. So instead, what they'll do is they'll do, and it, and it's either called a test drive, or they pocket you, and they see they see what your potential is. They're not going to necessarily sign you unless you have a body of work and they figure they can sign you and, and send you material and maybe make some money with you that afternoon. Really? Yes. It's hmm, interesting. So, all right. So, but you, you've got to create relationships with people in order to, to get into these people too, though. Well, you've got to create traction. You've got to have credits. Right. Uh, agents look out over the landscape. Every agent looks at the map of the U.S. or North America or the globe. They open their arms nice and wide and say, mine. <laughs> this is mine. And then all of a sudden they go, wait a second, who's that? Okay, he's over here, he's over there. All of a sudden they see somebody is taking work away from them. That's how they look at it. Now they're interested in talking to this person because they'd rather have them in the fold than have them competing with the people they're representing. So that's the very, very best way is to attract attention because you're booking work that they would like to have been in on. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, that makes sense. And that's yeah. very different. That's very different than the way it used to be. It used to be, you know, you were selling from possibility. Now mm-hmm. you're selling from being a package. Right. So, you know, I remember years ago when I first got to New York and I'd written a television show and my roommate was with William Morris and I didn't have an agent. I said, do you think I could talk to Gary and maybe he'd cover me on this and so forth? And I was like, you know, 12 years old at the time. Anyway, I'm being hyperbolic. <laughs> so go to Morris, and he'd go to William Morris and they drop the paperwork and he says to me, you know, he said, it's very rare for us to work with someone at this stage of their career. And I said, gee, really? He said, I thought agents were always looking for new talent. And so he said, no, he said, we're there for the second half of the career. And I said, oh, I see. You won't help me bake the bread, but you'll help me eat it. (laughs) He said, Ah. and quite frankly, agents that everybody is trying to be with have gotten to a point where they've actually earned the right to pick and choose in that way where they're not necessarily there in the beginning. You are. No one will love your career as much as you do. And so you have to get to a point where you kind of qualify for the team like the Olympics. And that's when, you know, you draw attention to yourself or you've got a body of work. And it doesn't have to be a huge, you know, it's just got to be something they wish they'd been in on. And that will get their attention. All so right. When you send your material, nice short little note, maybe three sentences, acknowledge who they are. Always, always acknowledge the people that you're talking to. Not, don't just jump in. Don't send them a novel about yourself. 
and then the material and, you know, in your note, you know, a couple of credits that will draw their attention. All right. Let's let's move on from representation because that's a discussion that can go on for hours, uh, especially if you've ever talked to an agent. Um, now, we, we think that, you know, that it's newbies that need coaching, people who are just getting into the business. Uh, I, you often work, you mostly work with very ex- experienced and really established voice talent. Why do they seek you out? Why do they need your help? Well, I use a lot of spa- sports metaphors, and I think the best one is grow or die. This is an organic thing that we do. There are a lot of factors that are changing all the time. That observation that Bob Lloyd made, you know, people are doing the same read they did when they got in the business, but the culture has changed. And um, the conversation has changed. If you, you know, go onto YouTube and look at some commercials that ran five years ago, you were already feeling a, a dated quality to them. Or go back to the 80s and the 70s and you hear the hash, just the the way that the uh, the technology has changed also changes the delivery. And so, um, you know, you want to stay on top of that just because the shifting sands are uh, are subtle and then all of a sudden it can catch up with you and you're post-peak. And you never want to get to that point. You always want to stay a little ahead of the curve or certainly on the curve. Hmm. How how do you, Maurice, um, stay so well tuned in? Because, like I said, you know, like you said, they're coming to you to mm-hmm. help them stay at the head of that curve. How do you? What do you do for yourself to stay ahead of that curve? I'm a sociologist at heart. I always have been. Behavior and social behavior has always been completely fascinating to me. I just have a huge appetite for learning and understanding. So I Mm. love that whole conversation. I love that whole aspect of it. I can never get enough. And I, I read a lot. I, you know, I tune into as much as I can, whether it's on television, watching film, certainly on the internet, but other cultural influences Mm -hmm. also have an impact because we are the quickest way to shift a message. You know, you can do it overnight. You can do it in a few seconds. So, um, you know, I've always said advertising doesn't necessarily invent anything. It sees something and then it helps bring it to the foreground and, and popularize it. And by doing so, connects itself to that image. So let's say, you know, Gundam, you know, Gundam style. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Somebody, somebody first saw that somewhere and had a sense that that was going to catch fire. And those first advertisers that were in on that now were seen as cutting-edge advertisers. But, you know, the artist leads the culture. People people move the culture forward. It's just about staying on top of and seeing, listening, and most importantly, not making it wrong. Well, if you could summarize what you would see as the curve right now, I mean, what can can you summarize that? I mean, it's I'm sure it's a whole discussion, but what do you see think, as being on the curve? I think there's a huge wake up that's going on in terms of each person realizing they can make a difference. I think that by virtue of the internet and so many so much going on that people are logging, uh, you know, weighing in on, I think they're realizing that there are steps to be taken, they're stepping up, speaking up, speaking out. So the, the personal signature, which I've always beat the drum for for 20-some years now, is more important than ever before. We want to hear a person talking to us, not a delivery. Right. Do you think that'll ever change? <laughs> we, there's a lot of people who are in radio and have you know what we call announcer voices. When I tried to get into the business, I was a, too much of an announcer. I tried right. for years to try and kill the announcer uh, and, and, be, and be myself. It's not an easy thing to do for a lot of people no, when they get in front of a microphone. How do you no. get someone to be themselves? Well, that's, you know, that's what I do day in and day out. And <laughs> each person is very different. But it also is about um, don't kill him because there's somebody who's still booking him. So, yeah, I, I don't, 
you know, I don't take anything away unless it's totally in the way. But it's a matter of um, having, you know, it's like your product line. You got in the business with your salad dressing. And there are always going to be those people who love your salad dressing. But Mm -hmm. because they loved your salad dressing, now they say, what else have you got? So nothing gets thrown away. Be Newman's own, right? Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. Like like Newman's own. Yes. If he had launched with all 132 products, people would have been overwhelmed. You launch with one thing, your signature, your core competency, and then you expand from there. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. As far as losing the announce and so forth, uh, trust me, that is a very, very intense process of, you know, first of all, there's a reason people go into radio. My theory is that people go into radio to hide, Mm -hmm. to hide behind a persona and a sound and a style. Voiceover doesn't want that. They want, you know, warts and all. They want you. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. A few good questions from the Mm -hmm. chat room have popped up too. Should we touch on those, Dan? Yeah, there's a couple more things we want to talk about, but let's let's see what okay. some of our audience has to yeah, say. Go ahead, back. Go well, that last question yeah. actually was from Devox. I should give him credit. The question about the curve. So thanks, Devox. Um, Corvo said, you know, h- how does someone who's not based in L.A. or New York or one of the major markets start cracking into agency type jobs? Because there's so many that are working outside of those markets now that established themselves when they were in LA, then had the freedom to move. But how do you start when you're not in that market? Again, you've got to attract the attention by doing work that's competitive. Yeah. If they think they're missing out on, you know, making money with you, um, then you've got you you've got some game. Mm-hmm. It's basically creating their that brand, right? That creating that, yes. that thing, that yes. something, that je ne sais quoi, and- whatever. And I always say, no one will love your career as much as you do. You've got to do that. You've got a longer, you've got a longer half life to the building process, simply because there are so many people out there. I think you know, I've I've, I've posted this statistic that a client uh, gathered, and this is a very real statistic from two thousand nine. That on any given day. There are over 1.3 million people pursuing voice work. That's a real figure from the union. So the, how many agents are there? How many managers are there? How many people are basically the conduits to the kind of work we're talking about? So they are in the catbird seat. They can pick and choose. So give them a reason to choose you. Give them a reason to know they're making space on that bench for you, and it's going to pay off for them. Mm-hmm. Well said. Well said. Yeah. Um, Steve Tardio said, I'd like to know how do we, as voiceover talent, market ourselves to casting directors or producers, et cetera, without stepping on our agent's toes? Ah. Uh, well, that's a, that's a tricky one. Mm. First of all, if there's someone that you are not hearing from, I would first always have the conversation with the agent first and say, you know, I notice I haven't ever, let's say in a a city where you're still seeing some people live, I haven't ever gone to XYZ agency. Is there a reason? And it may be that uh, your agent will say, well, we've tried to get you in several times and they just don't feel you're ready. Mm. You know, but at least get some sort of a comment from them um, or say, you know, is it something, you know, we could look at? And always use the we. Don't, mm. you know, the minute you say you, how come you haven't, you know, haven't, how you haven't gotten me in here? You're creating an adversary relationship. Right. And this is a partnership. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it may well be that they've gotten some resistance. They didn't just, they just didn't want to tell you. Um, and then, you know, the, the other is, if you're going to do a, a marketing campaign, have a conversation with the agent and say, look, this is what I want to do. I'd like, you know, I'd like us to send to your database. And then I have some other names I'm going to send to. And, uh, but I'd like it to look like it's coming from you. You pay for it, but you have to get your agent's blessing. And in that way, you know, it goes to a wider net than perhaps they're throwing at the time. And then they could benefit from that as well. Sage advice. Dan, let me throw it back to you. Okay, great. Yeah, there's... Most of our, our, our audience, I think all of them, 
Uh, we're by ourselves. Yes. Uh, we're, we, we live somewhat in a vacuum. Uh, and the business has changed so much. Now, there's, there's two levels to the business. You're dealing with you know, some of the really big stars in Hollywood, people whose names you may not know, but you certainly would recognize their voices uh, mm-hmm. if you hear a lot of commercials and things. Uh, taking direction is a very important skill as an actor and uh, as a, certainly as a voice actor. But a lot of times we're by ourselves and we're not getting any direction from the client. They might give you, you know, a little bit of spec. How do you self-direct yourself? What's, what's a really good technique to, to help you out with something well, like that's, that? Well, that's, again, that's a very, very big topic that I actually do a specific seminar for. And it has to do with the ability to, there are two kinds of listening. There's two kinds of listening. There's objective and subjective. Most talent, most performer, most artists are listening subjectively. When you then sit back and listen to what you've just laid down, that's objective listening. And what you really have to say is, is that an on-air read? Does that sound like someone could take that read, put some music or put some sound effects and use it? So right. that's the first is, you know, stop sending in auditions, send in finished reads. And second is, are you telling the story? Uh, uh, producer said to me years ago, I can't believe how many times somebody can read a script and uh, miss the joke. Now, he wasn't saying this was comedy. He was missing, you know, miss the point. Right. And a lot of times, you know, p- performers are so busy. How do I sound? You know, what's my voice like? I'm in a hitting the sweet spot in the mic and all of that. Is there mouth noise? They're missing the message. And, in an, you know, years ago, there used to be a sign at the uh, voice caster. This is when Bob had the voice caster. And it said, in the, please leave your uh, performance in the booth, not in the car on the way home. Hmm. And uh, what excellent. it says yeah. is, while you're driving home, your brain is still processing right. message. And then that light bulb goes off. So Why didn't I do this? Yeah. You know, it's actor's remorse. What happens is you read too soon. You know, you weren't ready. They came out in the lobby. They saw you. They grabbed you and they pulled you in because, you know, you wanted to be a nice person. But maybe you were busy talking or you're doing other things. You're at your home studio now. You're doing some work. Something comes in. You've got to, you know, get it out quickly because you've got a session coming up. Um, And it's a half-baked read. It's not serving you. Good enough isn't. Mm. It's incredibly high. I, and really being able to discern whether or not your read is competitive has to do with objective listening. I have a question that dovetails into that a little bit about auditioning. Um, you know, the quality of the audition, obviously the read has to be the, like the final. The quality of the production of the audition, let's say in terms of the way it's mastered, EQ'd, compressed, all that stuff, that's also very important, is it not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Am I digging too deep here tonight? I know you. <laughs> no, 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 no. I just don't want to hurt your feelings. No, no, please. No, don't hurt my feelings. I'm but not a voice actor. I tell you this. <laughs> I'm not, I can't no, hurt my feelings. techies. Yeah. Techies, and you always want, you know, stuff to sound a certain way and it right. be as good as it can be and pristine and so forth. Right. Times when I'm working with my business partner, Peter Cutler, of 23 years now, sound designer and so forth, mm-hmm. and, you know, we, uh, we do our production and, and uh, I listen and I said, okay, now we've got to step on some things. He goes, why? I said, because some of them are just too perfect. They're too beautiful. Mm. It pains him. But, you know, a lot of demos are pulled together because people are pulling things off the air or off YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, you know, someone dragged it over hot coals. (laughs) But um, the truth is, when it comes to the audition, yes, the optimum circumstances are that you're working from a studio, the microphone loves you, the processing and so forth, not too much because... You know, producers want to hear, you know, the raw, the raw material. But I have a, this story I tell all the time of a client who was on a vacation or a camping trip and she um, got an audition and she did the audition on her iPhone and she booked it and they wanted her the next day. And she said, I'm too far and I'm still on my vacation. I'm not coming back in the city. And they recorded it on the iPhone and it went on the air and it was a national spot. 
<laughs> I love it. Literally, it literally the iPhone. Not like not like a mic plugged into the iPhone, but the that actual was, iPhone. Excuse me, three iPhones back. That was the three. Wow. That was the four. Wow. wow. Yeah. Well, we well, know that microphones, while people obsess about them, are a small part of what really ends up to the recording. And if you know how to hold that phone and the acoustics are right, you can get away. It's pretty amazing what you can get away with, the right yes. skills. Yes. I mean, ultimately, day in and day out, you know, you want to send the best of the best. Yeah. Because your read lives in context. Someone's, you know, someone's audition is before you and after most of the time, unless you're first or last. Yeah. And so you don't want to suddenly sound like you're in an oil drum. Yeah. That's what I tell my clients. I say, you know, listen, you're going to be listened to among maybe hundreds. And if you're way low or super hot or way out of the norm, then, you know, that could hurt. So Yes. Mm -hmm. right. And much depends, of course, on what genre of material you're auditioning for, too. Right. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're doing uh, promo or image work, it's very, very different read, very, very different uh, compression than, say, narration. you know, some say, narration or yeah. someone talking about their baby or something along those lines. Or network to so, network. Or network, network to network. Network to Absolutely. network, television show to television show. But that's all part of what they do in post. Right. They're just listening for the delivery. Mm-hmm. Right. That's, you know, I, I said in my last notice, um, it all boils down to you in front of a microphone. That's right. that's the game. Everything else is tangential. Right. And and what we tell people on our show all the time is is it's all about your performance. Uh, you know, you want to sound clean. You don't want to sound like garbage. You know, technologically, but it's not your responsibility to make it sound like it's on the air. It's their job to do that. And they don't care if you have a production background. In fact, if you do, keep it to yourself. Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah, I learned mm. that one the hard way. Yeah. Uh, so some people are like, they give you a look when you say, well, you, you could do this. But uh, no, it's, and, and they're not hiring you for your production skill. They're hiring you for you trying to sound like you and trying we to interpret their skill. I found it very ironic. I've done a, quite a bit of consulting on television shows and, and film projects and so forth. And... I said, you know, I said, now as a, as a consultant, it's fascinating to me because I will bring up an observation and uh, they're paying me to do that. If I was on staff and I did that, I'd be fired. Right. So I was insubordinate. Uh. <laughs> so it's all perspective. Yeah. And so when you're, you know, when you're being hired to be something, be that. And, you know, as far as your production knowledge or any other, if you come from an agency background or whatever, I mean, a lot of times people know, but you keep it to yourself. It's, you know, it's one of the reasons why I suggest not having a picture of yourself on your site, even celebrities, because even though they know what Jeff Bridges looks like, if they're just hearing his voice, then they can imagine a lot more possibility than if they're looking at what Jeff looks like these days. Mm hmm uh -huh. And I think the same thing is is just be that voice and that signature and let them fill everything else in. All right. Thank well, you. Yeah, absolutely. One last thing. And mm -hmm. and and it's important because, you know, I've been a teacher and and I love to teach and you're a teacher. You teach people how to do this kind of stuff. We always had an expression in in the education business is that you teach best that which you learn, need to learn most. And uh, what, what do you learn from, from doing these sorts of things? You said you're a sociologist and, and, mm -hmm. and stuff, but, but what do you learn from all, all these amazing talents that you work with? Gosh. I think I could fill a book with that. Oh, yeah. Book all coming. Right. Book Actually, coming. Actually, Here's am. a pencil. I am. Ah. What, I, what I learn is, gee, I don't know if I could narrow it down and pick one thing. Yeah. Um, I think it has to do with uh, getting a handle on the noise in your head. Mm. Because the goal that I set for the work that I do is that you, you, you play full out. And there are so many ways, I often said, you know, when people say, oh, well, you know, someone said, you know, they're looking for the right thing for me and so forth. And I said, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but there's only one way to say yes. 
And there's so many other ways, especially on the West Coast, of saying no. We're going to pass. Oh, we're, you know, it's not quite right for us at that. You know, that's a no. And in the same way, the noise in the head, there are so many ways to create speed bumps for yourself. And much of the work that I do throughout the day is, sorry, that's my. It's okay. Time's up. (laughs) Brownies are ready. I guess so. Um, (laughs) It's it's just that that stuff that's swirling around in people's heads. There's so much information. There's so much conversation. There are so many, you know, frankly, people make stuff up and then act like it's true. You've got to filter all of that and really, really get to a point where you know what works for you and you know what you're bringing to the microphone. And to consistently do that And when there is something in the way, to notice it and do your very best to neutralize it. So I think that's ultimately, and I think that's in life too, is handling the noise. Mm. All right. Well, that's our job too, is to handle the noise, George. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Another kind of noise. And get rid of some of it. Right. Maurice, this has been an absolute treat. We've been been wanting to have you on the show for so long. And uh, I know our audience is incredibly appreciative. If they would like to contact you, because <laughs> everybody does. <laughs> well, um, thank you know, you. And, they, and they, you know, they, I, I say, well, who do you know? I'm looking for a coach. Well, you got to go work with Maurice Tobias. How would one get in contact with you without interrupting you and bothering you? <laughs> well, I, the best for me is email. And, you know, go to my website, send me an email, and uh, we will get back to them. Outstanding. Well, thanks so much for being on our show this week. It's been absolutely wonderful having you on. It's been great fun. Thank you. Thank you All so right. much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. All right. We'll be back. We still got lots more here in East West Audio Body Shop, so stay tuned. VoiceOver Extra, the voiceover industry's online news, education, and resource center 24-7. Hundreds, probably thousands of free how-to articles for voiceover success, ranging from home studio to voice acting to business. A free voiceover industry directory, calendar of industry events, resource links, a store, and much more. Bi-monthly webinars on all topics of voiceover, free subscriptions to newsletters, reports, announcements, daily news, and features at voiceoverextra.com. Now back to eWebs. Thank Dan and George's wives. For what? You have no idea. Now, here's Dan and George. Yeah, Sunday night, family surroundings, but it gets done. And here we are. There we are. And our thanks again to Maurice for joining us tonight. Boy, she was great. Oh, Boy, man. She, that's the stuff that we don't think about. You know, we're, we're in our studios day in and day night, you know, day in and day out, week yeah. after week. And it's like, uh, do the audition, do the audition. But you got to slow down and read what you're reading. It's, they're, they're, they're not hiring you so much for your voice. I mean, it's the uniqueness of your voice. But how does that unique voice capture what they wrote? And not to worry about the technical stuff. Let us worry about the technical stuff. You know, mm-hmm. set it, forget it, and know that and be confident in your in your technical. Uh, but they're not hiring you for your production skill. They're hiring you for sounding clean, but sounding like you know the copy. Mm-hmm. And so that was uh, some great points there. I'm glad she was able to join us for uh, so nice of her. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, what else we got going on tonight? We, we got to thank Carlin things. Hogan. Oh, that's right. Let's fly this thing in here. Yeah, I well, actually- I actually. Took a look to see if there was something that would be relevant based on our conversation tonight. And he does have something that I think is pretty useful. Let me go full screen on that. The laws of branding. The laws of branding. You know, so she was talking about the only way you're going to really hook an agent is to have already created a brand for yourself. In essence, you had to have already created, found out who yourself is and, and marketed it out there. So... This seems to be a book that would help you with that. Would you have to agree? <laughs> I, I, I would certainly agree. <laughs> have you read it by chance? I have not. Uh, no, I've, I've read, you know, a couple of books like it. Mm. You know, Guerrilla Marketing is one of my favorite and mm. stuff like that. But I do want to read that one. And uh, because it's, it's all, you know, 
at least uh, you know in Hollywood in the big markets, branding apparently is everything because they they like she said they want to do who's on my bench who who is it that fits into this particular role yeah uh, you know and I think in the commercial business that clearly is the case when you start getting into more of the industrials and in e learning and things along those lines mm-hmm. it's a little bit different but they you know you still have people that know. This person can handle this type of a read. This person is very good at explaining these types of things, right? And that sort of thing. So there's also a little bit of branding in you know in the majority of work, but the big money work, it's all about. I, I think it is all about branding. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a good book to have. So I mean, it's just one of the examples of the stuff that Harlan's carrying on the site. It's not just mic cables and you know stands. It's educational material. Um, it's it's all sorts of stuff to support your business. Absolutely, and and reading is important, and staying current on uh, on on certain things. That was another thing she, you know, that that Maurice was talking about was being, you know, being culturally literate, tuned in. Yeah, so buy books over at voiceoveressentials dot com and uh, look at some of the other stuff he has. He's got a good library of things. Mm-hmm. So if you want good books and good mic cables and good mics like the V O one A or nice little portable studio, voiceoveressentials dot com is the place to go. And we'd like to thank Harlan Hogan for sponsoring us every week here on East West Audio Body Shop. Because without him, you'd be seeing a lot of other stuff, too. <laughs> so, uh, Is that so a good go, thing or a bad thing? That is a good thing that he sponsors us. That's because right. that, you know, But, you know, he's got his book, you know, on, on home studios and uh, some of the other things. Or, you know, the As Heard on TV cap. Right. You know, the, uh, the, you know, the, the studio light. And, you know, so, you know, voiceover happening. Uh, that sort of thing. So uh, go on over there, voiceoveressentials.com, and buy all his stuff. Please do. And he'll be on, on the, pretty soon to talk about some new announcements. Very, very shortly. Yeah, I had, next month. Yeah. You know, it was great of Harlan to come over to, uh, you know, to where we were installing Studio Seat this week. Uh, and because uh, he went way out of his way. And uh, he's. He's, you know, you meet somebody on Skype and you talk to him and you get the guy and you get to know the guy. I felt like I knew him when he walked in, you know, a little shorter than I thought, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but he was a wonderful guy and it was, and it was, and I really like to thank him for showing up for that. And, uh, you know, we'd like to get studio suit on voiceover essentials and, he, and as soon as we figure out how to package it, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Mm-hmm. All righty. Well, I got a little video else? package. Tell us, Nam. Yeah. What? It's too exciting. I have so much stuff from Nam. It's 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 crazy. It's going to take me uh, some time to get it all uh, cleaned up and and packaged for your enjoyment. But I do have one thing I managed to get together today when I had a little a, a brief hour downtime while Ella was at a birthday party with mom. And uh, so, uh, well, I'll, here you go. I don't think it needs much more introduction. So uh, check this out. Hi, Jim Bailey here, Director of Product Development for Aphex. I want to show you today our brand new Microphone X, which is a USB microphone that has built-in analog processing before the conversion to digital. It's got an optical compressor, an exciter, and big bottom. So before you even get to the conversion to digital, you're compressing your audio, you're optimizing it tonally, then you convert to digital and go straight into your computer. It's also got a HeadPod 4 class headphone amplifier in there. The long listening, ultimate clarity, very great sounding uh, head, headphone amplifier in there. Comes with a stand, zipper case, USB cable, and recording software. So that's the compressor enable, the exciter big bottom enable, and separate adjustments for the exciter amount and big bottom amount. How would you characterize the compression? Is it designed to be very gentle and pretty transparent? Extremely gentle. It's totally transparent. That's sort of the nature of an optical compressor. If you can hear it working, it's it's not happening. So, you know, the Apex design philosophy is always to make your compressors as transparent as possible. MSRP is three forty nine. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> what do you think? I, boy, you know, if you don't like front end processing, it's like, well, why bother? But something <laughs> like that, boy, it's it's getting so so self contained. It's amazing. I mean, I'm never a big fan of front end processing per se, but if you're using a compressor that really is pretty transparent, 
that little extra safety net can sometimes be wonderful. I mean, if you're traveling, you know, you're working outside of your usual environment, it can be really challenging to get something down that sounds great. And if, if that's one less thing to really think about um, and it really sounds good, then, you know, it's it'd be something to check out. A- Aphex, they're, they're a really interesting company, and they had a few things. Um, I'll have more videos of uh, from another one of their products that they released to the show, too. Because they really are thinking outside the box. I hate that phrase, but it's what else? Can we, we can we come up with a new one? <laughs> no, for a new phrase for that. Uh, I'll but work they, on it this week. They are coming up with some um, interesting uh, stuff. So anyway, people are asking if I got audio samples. You know, I didn't get audio samples this year. I've done that in years past. It's a pointless exercise. Um, the noise floor. <laughs> speaking of noise floor, the noise floor on the floor of Nam Show. That's average, a real noisy floor. Averages between eighty and ninety decibels. Jeez. Um, you know, sometimes even louder, and uh, it's unbelievably loud in there. The reason that I got clean audio is because he had a mic, you know, two inches from his face. Um, you know, but yeah. So I didn't really go through that exercise this year. I really spent a lot more time just trying to get as many. Uh, product uh, reviews or at least first look interviews as I could. So, right. um, but it was a blast. I, that show is so fun and um, I'll be coming back to that every year. That was the winter NAM show. There's a summer NAM in Tennessee. Maybe it moved this year. I think it was in Nashville the last few years, but uh, um, winter NAM's here in LA. So I'll make sure I'm there every time. I have a lot more. I probably have 40 of those videos. So I'll right. roll them out as I can. Yeah, you're going to throw them on on the eWeb's website and of course the yeah. uh, the Neo Studio Tech website. They'll, they'll be, on, they'll be well they'll be on the uh, no, they'll be on the uh, the eWeb's um YouTube channel. Okay, yeah, great. And I'll make sure they're linked through the website as well. Excellent. All right. Well, we had a couple of questions this week. We did? Oh yeah, we, we did. did. We did. There was a question on buzzing. Aha. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, somebody was saying they've got buzzing on their on their microphone. Didn't we talk about this last week though? Um, the buzzing, we may have, we may well, have. Well, let's talk about it again. Sure. You know, if you get buzzing now, you, there might be a little bit of buzzing on this thing. We found that if you, if you take a, a, a ribbon mic and go too close to the screen, it starts to buzz a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're generally not going to get lots of that kind of stuff with a, with a, with a good condenser microphone. Yeah. If you're getting buzzing or whining or something like that, generally it's a bad mic cable. So yeah. Start with uh, the cable. Start with the cable. And generally if you replace the cable, the problem goes away, but uh, we were seeing stuff. People were like explaining, well, you got to go through this and grounding sticks. You know, it's got to be 12 feet deep. And I'm like, what the heck are these people talking some about? Serious engineer geeking and geeking out. That, yeah. Stop being engineer geeks and just do the simple stuff. And, yeah. and you have these problems. Of course, if you're using, you know, if you're, if you're using a simple, uh, simple chain, the shorter the chain, the less that can go wrong. That's right. Simple, 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 um, simple, simple. Yeah. Sam Prindle. Just wrote this this afternoon. Um, I, hi guys, love the program. I greatly appreciate your expertise. What is the best way to mount my VO mic upside down? Many thanks, yeah. Sam Prindle. Well, why well, don't I've, we demonstrate? I've, I've got mine somewhat handy as well. Yeah. Um, use my. Uh, this is my favorite way. I'm using one of these articulated boom arms. This particular right. one I got on um, on eBay. It's called Crusher, C-R-U-S-H-E-R. If you type mm-hmm. in Crusher space Mike, M-I-C, you will find this thing. It's like a $50 boom arm, but it doesn't feel cheap. It's made well. But I, I've got the thing mounted upside down uh, like this. Um, I don't, you know, I think it depends on the kind of mic you're using as to what kind of right. mount it has. Dan's holding the same mic in his hands. The exact same mic. So now there's a couple issues here. First, if you have it right set up, how do you hang it upside down you go like that right uh it's, and, but it's, you may it, have to twist the mic around in the basket right right you may Sometimes have to twist it's it. facing the wrong way and you have right. to turn the mic yeah, make sure way. you're talking into the logo side of the mic um, yes. yeah because if you flip it over you know it's ama- amazing how many times people say, it sounds so muffled well because you're talking into the wrong side of the mic it, yeah. you, or they're talking into this side which is even yeah. worse there but is a way you, to mount them from the ceiling as well there is, you know, just big rubber bands. And- well, yeah, I think Heil, Mike Booms, I think Heil has a, a ceiling mounted uh, system that you right. can use if you really right. want to go that way. But the idea is to keep it as isolated as possible away from your computers and stuff like that. And that's why right. it has a shock mount. Right. But, you know, generally these shock mounts have a normal thread 
which fits on the end of a boom like this one yeah. and just flip it over. And then of course we talked about mic technique last week, you know, by having it up here, your copy can be down here and it's completely out of the way. Yeah. So that's the go. answer to that question. Got another one? Take it this way and go it that way. I think that was it for this week. Okay, cool. I think that's plenty to go on. Well, here's one from Lee. I'm not sure. Uh, real quick. He said, <laughs> Lee, Lee Penny said, no offense to Dan's studio suit, but yeah. in a six by six booth, isn't it a better option than those rock wool panels? Wrong! I don't, I don't anticipate a lot of exterior noise coming. I think it'd be mostly to cancel reflection dampening. Well, that's that was the whole point with right. studio suit is that it is dampening. It's right. I, you know, I'm, it's, it's not, not soundproofing. soundproofing. You want to try and isolate yourself best you can. Mm -hmm. That's why closets are good because you can go in there and close the door, uh, which will eliminate a fair amount of sound. Because you're in a home studio, you want to be able to reduce the noise floor as much as possible. It's almost impossible without tremendous investment. And we've seen, you know, people with you know how they've invested in in their in their home studio and put a lot of construction and work into it and yeah. stuff. And, and our good buddy, Paul Stracurta has a great book on that. Mm -hmm. So go to his website, nethervoice.com and buy his book because the proceeds go to a, a wonderful charity. Oh, yeah. uh, but he hit, does a great job with uh, explaining in, in his wonderful uh, witty way, how you go about, you know, soundproofing a room. It's not easy. It takes time and you need help. Um, and uh, it's, when you're starting out, if you can afford to and you have a nice closet, use the closet to isolate yourself best you can. With Studio Suit, it dampens interior noise from bouncing around, right. which is what we were explaining earlier. Mm -hmm. Does it keep noise out? A little it, bit. A little bit. If yeah. it reduce, if you can get your noise floor down to minus 50, and, it, and if, if, if your noise floor is at minus 45 and you have it, you put this in and this will easily lower lower it by five or six db mm -hmm. you can get under that noise floor and that might be enough to use uh you know some other methods to you know reduce background noise so yeah that's that's the intention of uh of, of studio suit it works great it's uh it's a, a wide spectrum type of thing and uh i mean you can the rock wolves works great too but it's primarily used for sound transmission uh, prevention then and for for bass traps and stuff like that and this yeah. sort of eliminates the need for that it can, it can do both it can do both yeah but it's a little harder to you know the thing that's cool about the studio suit design is that it's a minimally frustrating installation you know you hang this stuff and you're pretty much done the other kind of panels that are that are more you know prefabricated and wrapped in fabric while they look they may look a little nicer you have to oftentimes have them custom made to fit the space or right. um, the installation process can be a bit of a pain. So, right. you know, way the, the, the two solutions will both work. It's just a matter of how, how complex do you want it to be and, uh, you know, how much investment do you want to make? Exactly. Yeah, you go on YouTube and watch people building their home, you know, you know their vocal booths. And they're both mostly musicians and rap artists and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Some fascinating things that they try. And, uh, it, again, it doesn't have to be sound tight. It just has to, you want to reduce the reverberation a little bit. It has to be to quiet enough. It has to be quiet enough. Right, right. So anyway, so I think that wraps things up pretty yeah. nicely for tonight. We're going to finish right on time tonight. Right. 10 o'clock. Our new format, hour and a half. <laughs> it's, we pretty much nail an hour and a half every show. It's pretty, I know. pretty consistent. I know. I know. But, uh. <laughs> But we have lots of people to thank, of course. Uh, our producer, Catherine Curridan, who... It's driving or something right now. She's, she's oh, not she, even... She came up to L.A. for something. Yeah, she came for a play or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. But she's been helping us with booking guests and... Uh, she, she, yeah, she brought us from Maurice tonight, she got which us, is awesome. We got Maurice Tobias. We got lots of other great people coming up in February. Uh, next week, we're going dark next week, aren't we? Did we decide Super Bowl. for the Super Bowl? Super Bowl, we're going dark. Yeah, we'll take it. We'll take a night off. Let everybody yeah. get their hot wings on. Yeah, absolutely. Especially here in Buffalo, mm -hmm. where we have the best hot wings um, from Duff's. But <laughs> anyway, um, the uh, yeah. So we won't be here next week. Go watch the football game, and uh, you know, but you, you can now remember you can always have your own Google Hangout. That's so, right. You know, I mean, we don't have to be there. You know. Tony, you're in charge of that. Anthony, get it. You you take care of that. <laughs> well, uh, looks like we got Deb Monroe on February 10th. Deb Monroe is going to be joining us. That's right. All right. And um, I'm looking and through our guest list and seeing who's who's in green. Terry Daniel, 
Oh yeah, uh, Terry and Trish. T- Terry and Trish are going to be on this awesome. show. That's the 17th. Voice Over Cafe. 17th of February. Right. And then then we were planning on having an, an Academy Awards party. Oh you yeah, know, we're going to just, I yeah. Mean, we, 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 we had a great time doing the New Year's Eve party. Mm-hmm. And uh, even though it wasn't quite New Year's Eve, but it was still mm-hmm. fun. Uh, so I figured another excuse to wear my tux, we'll do that. <laughs> we'll have we'll have an Academy Awards party, and uh, you know we'll talk some shop, and we'll say, all right, now who's who's getting best costume uh, designer now? <laughs> I <laughs> exactly yeah, saw some great movies over the last couple of days. I saw Zero Dark Thirty on Friday, and uh-huh. then uh, and then um, uh, uh, Argo uh, last night. Oh, I would like to see Argo. Did you Argo. see Django? If not, I yeah, I'll wait till I can't it comes handle, out. I I'm sorry. I just I'm 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 a weak I'm a wimp. I can't handle that kind of violence. I I, I don't want to you know indulge uh, Quentin Tarantino in his in his uh, his habits. Yeah. So his stuff. So yeah. I, 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 I got over that when I watched you know uh, I watched Reservoir Dogs when I was in you know college with my buddies you know and I kind of moved on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Gosh, I mean, he's yeah. talented, but man, mm, that is stuff hard. That stuff's hard to take. I heard him interviewed yep. on uh, NPR too with Terry yeah. Gross, and she really kind of nailed she him. You know, she was like, "Listen, him. what's with the violence?" And he, uh, he she even brought up the uh, the shooting, you know, in uh, December, the school shooting, and he was like, I- "I'm offended that you even brought that up. I see no correlation." Boy, talk about a topic we shouldn't start now. Yeah, let's not get into that. Yeah. But anyway, it's yeah. Um, I won't be seeing that one, but I'm definitely going to see Argo and I have a lot of, I got a, got a lot of catch. Oh, I got to see Les Mis. I have not oh, seen that. Oh, I heard an interview. Oh, I heard an oh. interview with the guy that was the production sound mixer on that film. Oh, what a challenge that must have been. No, you, it's amazing. I got to dig it up. I think it's on pro tools, experts.com or one of those, one of those, you know, uh, podcast, uh, uh, blogs, uh-huh. but they, they did an hour long audio, uh, interview and, uh, it is awesome. It actually makes me want to see it really badly because everything, but the opening scene, which I heard is pretty, in, pretty intense, yeah. everything else, when you see someone on screen singing, you're hearing the performance live. Oh yeah. Yeah. It is absolutely. not dubbed. And, you know, we take this for granted from Broadway and stuff. But to do that in a theatrical environment, I mean, in a, in a cinematic environment with the amount of stuff going on on a set is a huge undertaking. Um, yeah. Let me just say that they actually used CGI to hide the microphones really? on, the, on the medium shots. That's hmm. how far they took it, which I think is a precedent that I would love to see uh, happen for other films because we've gotten so used to these muffled lavalier sounding, you know, these mics that are tucked inside everybody's clothes. Right. We've gotten used to that muffled sound. And thanks to like, you know, shows like West Wing and stuff. And not that it was a good show, but I mean, everybody got used to that. And so now they're saying, I want good sound. And we'll, we're willing to even CGI out a microphone whenever necessary to get the good sound. That's what they wow. did. Amazing times we went. Yeah, go cool. see Lay Miz. Fabulous. I mean, Definitely. I've seen I've seen the stage show. I've seen it with Colm Wilkinson. It's a great I saw the show. stage show too. I've seen very few musicals. But yeah. I have seen that one. I saw yeah. like the broad, the touring Broadway um, show of it. Yeah, actually, Cole Wilkin- Yeah, Cole Wilkinson was in this one though. He's in the movie. He's he plays the priest at the beginning. Oh, far out at, at, the, at the at the convent that uh, the Valjean shows up at. Anyway, uh, and Life of Pi. Go see Life of Pi. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Great movie. Great cinematography in that. Oh, I mean, man. Ang Lee's a great director. It him. was it was wonderful. Great story. Anyway, we're just rambling on here. Um, yeah, man. But we won't be here next week, but we will be here the following week with Deb Monroe. And I know Harlan's going to be joining us, and you will be joining us, and that's why we're here. We couldn't do this show without you, and uh, we really appreciate it. And, of course, we will take donations to keep the commercials off of here. Just go to – just look right above the screen. If you're on our website, uh, it says donate. We could really help. Ewaps.com, really help. click the donate. Any amount. Any amount. Any, we'll take any it. amount. Yeah, we'll thank take Thank you, guys. It's a big help. Anyway – I'm Dan Leonard in the East. And I'm George Whittem in the West. And together we are East West West Audio Audio Body Body Shop. Have yourselves a great week. We'll see you in two weeks and take care. Bye-bye.